Unlocked is brought to you by Invincible, a program designed to unlock the potential of people and teams inside your organization. Join companies like Pfizer, Delta, the CDC, Google, and Chick-fil-A and others in over 116 countries that are currently using this program to increase productivity and develop healthy cultures. Access hundreds of hours of content that is accessible anytime, anywhere. And finally, use real-time data to understand the health of every team inside your organization, which teams are performing and which ones aren't. Then understand the why behind that performance. Get free access to Invincible for 30 days by visiting www.giant.tv slash 30 days. Hi, welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of people. Today, I've got Larry Robertson on the call, and he is going to talk to us a lot about his latest book, first of all, called Rebel Leadership and what that means and the new way we need to think about leadership versus the old way. So Larry is an award-winning author and consultant and speaker. Um, he has uh, also written many columns in the Creativity Post, CEO World, Inc. Magazine, Thrive Go Global, Smart Brief, and, and others. He is a Fulbright scholar as well as a graduate from both Stanford University and Northwestern College School of Management. So you're going to get some awesome stuff out of this interview. Larry has, you can tell, he's like a professional uh, interviewee. Uh, this guy has his talking points. This guy has some direct, direct actions that you can take to improve yourself as a leader, but we also bridge this out into talking about culture and what that really means in the grand scheme of things as we're managing uncertain times, okay? And he is very clear about this is not just about COVID. Um, it's about uncertain times in general. As we are managing those, what are the important things we need to think about? What are the important things we need to do as people and as leaders and as even team members inside of our organization? So let's get on with the interview. Here we go. Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. So you are a veteran book writer. Now, I'm just going to call you that. After three <laughs> books, you become a veteran, right? I didn't That's know my... what the number was, but I'm glad to, to hit the hurdle. That's it. I've, I've just coined it. So it's, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, your third book, Rebel Leadership, is just released in June, June 1st. Um, the launch, there's the cover there and the, and the background. Um, give us the premise of this book a little bit. Where, why this one now? Now, how to thrive in uncertain times. We've just had this thing called COVID happen, which created a lot of uncertain times. Was that the spark? I mean, what, what was it that, that wanted you to uh, write this book? Yeah, I, that's a, I appreciate you asking that because it's a really important question. And the simple answer to the, the back end of it was, no, it wasn't COVID at all. In fact, I'd been working on this book for, I don't know, somewhere between two and three years before the pandemic started. And the one of the real incentives for it was that uncertainty is not COVID. COVID is an example of uncertainty. But if we look back at the last 20 years, the first 20 years of, of this century, this has been an increasingly uncertain century. And until COVID, we often experienced that in pockets or we saw it at a distance. <clears throat> the uniqueness of COVID was it brought it to everybody's shore. But this uncertainty has been coined as a term, really going all the way back to the military use of this term. It's an, it's an acronym, VUCA, which stands for vol Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And when the term was coined, it was because the military was seeing instances where the world as they knew it, the world that they had trained to operate in, the world in which they had defined their formula for success, was dramatically different. And their way of leading in that world, their way of executing in that world wasn't working. So you think about encountering Al-Qaeda on the streets of Iraq, very, very different scenario than the theaters to battle that they were looking at. 
So, so VUCA became this very interesting term that was thrown out around there, but it was always considered situational, right? This, this situation is volatile, uncertain, complex, et cetera. But what's happened over the last 20 years, and COVID really shows this, is that the world is that all the time now. And this idea that if we get past this pandemic, suddenly uncertainty is over, is really a, a very wistful thought, but a false narrative of where we really are. This is what I call our new abnormal. And if we realize that the world is going to be abnormal all the time, it tells us a couple of things, one of which is we can't lead the way we always have. And that's where rebel leadership comes in. Rebel leadership is this combination of two concepts we love and sometimes loathe. One is the rebellious innovator, the creative, uh, the, the person who thinks about the better way or the new way to do things, usually by looking at the world and saying, you know, that, that could be better or that's problematic and I have a way to solve it. We love that part of the rebel. We hate the part where they're disruptive just for the sake of being disruptive. And we like the idea of leadership because it gives us this sense of comfort that we're going to go somewhere positive and someone is going to take us there. The downside of leadership is that we expect that to come from some kind of hero. And we're really always in waiting for this hero that's never coming. There's no individual that ever leads in total, leads an organization or comes up with all the ideas or solves all the problems. So rebel leadership is saying, how do we get the best of both? How do we get that innovative, adaptable element and that leadership element? And the truth is it's inside all of us. So this is really about how do you bring that out in a group context and make organizations and teams more adaptable to this environment that we're in, this VUCA environment. That's what rebel leadership is all about. Holy moly, that was a great intro. Is that like the first intro of your book? I mean, that was just so well said. I love that. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> I appreciate that. I think it's more, I think about this a lot, including in the run-up to the book. Uh, and people are really talking about this now because uncertainty is real and, the, and it's frightening. And we don't always know how to deal with it. So I think the more that you talk about it, maybe the crisper the message gets. Um, what I'm trying to do as I talk about it, though, is let people realize that this is an experience everybody's having and make it a conversation everybody should have. Okay. Do you think that there is hesitation to have that conversation? Do you think people are reserved? And if they are, then why? Yeah, that, again, um, wonderful place to take this. Let's break down people. Leaders are hesitant to have this conversation. And let's take the simplest reason. If I, as a leader, open up a conversation about how uncertain the environment is, this just even the environment in which we're going to do whatever we do, I am acknowledging that I don't have all the answers. And we've been taught regularly since the time we were children and there was a teacher in front of the classroom and that teacher was going to tell us what we were gonna learn, tell us when we'd learned it well enough by giving us a grade, show us how we got to advance to the next stage. From the time you're a kid to your first job where you're trained to do that job on and on and on, there's this message reinforced that the leader somehow equals leadership in total. And it's just not true. So leaders are, in uh, many of them are hesitant to have this conversation because it's kind of this acknowledgement to themselves that they're not superheroes. And it's this larger acknowledgement that maybe I'm, maybe I'm shirking my responsibility by, not, by saying that I don't have all the answers when nothing could be further from the truth. The leader's job is to create that environment where everybody can step up and be a leader in their own way. So in terms of the hesitancy, it's leaders who are hesitant. Ironically, employees, team members, leaders down the, the, the ladder, if you will, are not hesitant about acknowledging this at all. In fact, they're really embracing this idea that I may not like it, but this is our new abnormal. Let's operate within that scope. And when they see their leaders not doing that, guess what they're doing? They're leaving. So McKinsey did this study, McKinsey and Company, a management consulting firm. Um, they survey leaders and employees all the time. And just over the last few months, they did a study to try to gauge this. They found that 26% of employees right now are in the process of preparing to leave their job. And this is the shocking thing, Scott. Another 40% expect to leave their current employment by the end of the year. 
So they not only feel the, the power that's there in this uncertainty, which I think we, we often tend to overlook that there's, there's power and opportunity in this, but the second and more important thing is they're not waiting for leaders to figure it out or to tell them what to do. They're taking matters into their own hands. And frankly, in the short run, I think that's a very good thing. That's incredible. Those stats are, are crazy when you think about, so I'm sure there's multiple reasons why, why that is happening. Um, this job market right now is I I've heard something about, um, it it's causing people to feel more empowered, right? Yes. When, when yes. they're like, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there looking for people right now. And I could just leave, you know, like the, the powers on the employee side now. And I think it's up to that leadership up to that, that organization to figure out how are you going to help this person feel like if they leave, they're going to be losing something, right? Or, or by staying, they're going to be gaining. So what are they gaining by staying? What are they, yeah. what making it hard for them to make that decision, right? How do we make it difficult for someone to want to leave us? Um, and I think that's going to come down to that aspect of a leader not pretending to have all the answers, but being open about, hey, maybe I don't have all the answers and I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to be open and I'm going to ask for collaboration and we're going to work on this as a team. I'm going to help you feel invested. I'm going to help you feel like you're part of the solution with me, right? Um, yeah. And I think that that kind of culture is, is really what's going to probably help. What do you think about that? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, I would take <clears throat> everything you said and I would I would encourage you to to like you meaning the audience to put that on steroids, right? It's not just what are you going to gain by by staying here? It's where am I going to give you voice in why any of us are here? So, you know, you you wonderfully talk a lot about brand. And I think what individual employees are thinking about now is hang on a second, I, I've been working for something called brand that somebody else mysteriously defines for me. All I'm doing is executing within that whatever they think is going to make that brand look good. And I think every individual now, given that their world has been so severely disrupted, is saying, I, I have some agency in my own brand. And if I'm going to come work for you, what I want to know is, what does my brand benefit from by being part of this shared purpose, this shared brand? And if I really am part of that, I want to be part of how we define it. I want to be part of how we execute on it and prove it out. And what's interesting to me is this isn't theoretical. This isn't just employees saying, well, maybe that will happen or certain uh, organizations saying, well, maybe we should go that way. There are organizations across the spectrum, across sectors that for the last 20 years have been leaning into this idea of shared purpose, of leadership, not just being at the top, but leadership moving across the organization based on what's the environment like now and who in our organization is best equipped to lead us to address that particular problem or take advantage of that particular opportunity. When we all say shared purpose, how can we say that if we're not all contributing to the conversation? How can we say that we're you know, well in pursuit and likely to achieve our shared purpose if we never challenge it? How can we say that it will ever be accomplished if it's not tied to every decision we make, everything we do every day with everyone. And that sounds kind of like a frightening concept to let everybody in. It sounds like you're releasing chaos, but it actually reduces it. And it increases those things that rebel leadership is all about. It increases adaptability, innovation, uh, resilience. All these things we want are not achieved by buckling down. They're actually achieved by opening up. And there's lots of proof out there. So smart. And I'm going to, um, you know, the, 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 the reason the show is called Unlocked, right? It's about unlocking the potential of people right. and how do we do that? Right. And I think you've hit on a couple, couple of things here. I wanted to elaborate on. I love, 
I love that you brought the brand thing into this, right? And and I love what you said. It kind of spurred another layer of thoughts for me on top of the, the brand stuff I already talk about as far as having a leadership brand or an organization brand, a team brand. What is that and what does it mean? Um, and, and in essence, a brand is your reputation. It's what people say about you when you're not around. Okay. It's not a logo. It's not a color palette. It's, it's that, right? We have a personal brand. Our teams have a brand and our bosses have a brand and our organization has a brand. Now, if I'm associated, I've got a purpose, right? In my own head of what I want to achieve in my life. Yeah. And if I'm, a, if I'm aligning myself to an organization that isn't aligned in my purpose, then, and people understand my purpose, and they all do, they see the organization and they kind of see some things the organization's doing. They're like, hold on a second, Scott, like you're part of that. Mm. Like, that doesn't seem so now my brand seems either inauthentic or misaligned or contradictory to what I tell people because now I'm associating myself with this organization or even this team, right? And then people maybe in the past, employees or people on my team will look at our boss and go, you still work for that guy? Yeah. And then I'll go, yeah, you know, it's part of, you know, they're going to go, and that's going to reflect on my brand as, as a team member, right? Um, and as a person about, that's my reputation. They're going to go, gosh, Scott, like I thought he was, you know, he's kind of selling out or he's just, you know, looking for this. So I think that's really important as we as we put in this concept of, how do we as leaders, how do we as individuals shape that perspective to go into uncertainty with an aligned purpose, an aligned goal, personal alignment with team alignment, and organizational alignment as we go forward? Yeah. And, and so this is, that's a big statement, right? That you just made. How do we, how do, we do that? And, and so let me just, for example, to make it real, let me, let me build within a story. About six, I think it's been almost seven years ago now, Doug McMillan took over at Walmart. And a few years into his run there, he had already done some dramatically bold things, some very unexpected things for the leader of an organization that has been massively successful, has deep assets, really, you know, doesn't have to cater to anybody, doesn't really have to change their model. And he was dramatically changing the model. And, and it all was driven by a statement he made in an interview one day, or I, I think this kind of encapsulates it. He said, you know, a, a, an organization of 1.3 million people. It used to be that we made big strategic decisions on an annual basis, maybe on a quarterly basis. He said, now it's daily. And that he even jokes with some leaders that it's really more hourly. And it was a statement to say the job is too big for any one person. So if we want to continue to be this very powerful brand, I'm gonna circle back to the brand message now. What we have to realize, he, he told everybody who would listen to him, is that brand isn't just this thing we say we want to be or this thing we, we put out there when we're trying to sell a product. Brand is who we are. So brand really is the culture that we have here. One of the people I interviewed for the book was, was Doug's senior director of global culture, diversity, and inclusion. His name is Russell Schaefer. And I asked Russell, I said, okay, Doug is making culture and brand so important to what Walmart does. He says it applies to all 1.3 million employees across the globe. Really? Is that true? If that is true, what do you actually do as the person who leads up global culture here? What do you do to make sure that happens? And I loved his definition of culture. He said, culture is the things that we do and are doing right now. It's not what we did. It's not what we will do, but it's our words and our values in action in this moment. He called it a litmus test. And I think that's really what a powerful brand is. If a brand is used as a litmus test, it, it, what is what we say we are, what we're doing in this moment? Is this new project we're launching in alignment with that, right? If it's used in that way, and if you take corrective action when it's not, either by adapting your brand as you go, or adapting or expanding or eliminating some of those projects that are in conflict with it, suddenly you are really creating that powerful concept that we know is brand. I mean, when we think of brands that we 
admire or think of brands that we are attracted to. We're attracted because they speak to something inside us. When an organization is saying, yep, that's the way our culture is going to run, not just going to speak to the person at the top, but speak to everybody here about their connection to this brand and show them that they are actually impacting it, that's something powerful. Love it. Thank you so much for, for, for saying that. So you, you talked about Doug McMillan. Would you consider him a rebel leader? Would you define would. it that way? I would. And, and part of the reason I do is what I just said. He, he has said multiple times, I can't do this job alone. I can tell you that as great as some of the CEOs of Walmart were before him, including Sam Walton way back in the day, I've never heard a CEO of Walmart, let alone most major organizations say, it isn't about me. I can't do this alone. And it's nice window dressing if it only remains words, but he's really embedded it deeper. He's not the only one. And I think the thing that's important here is that while I would call him a rebel leader, this concept is about rebel leadership. And so the idea here is not to create this heroic image of leaders. What's heroic, if you wanna put it that way about Doug McMillan is he's creating the environment. It is not heroic in the sense of he's coming up with every idea, solving every problem and doing every job. That's never gonna happen. He's, he's allowing the behavior to be created. One of the other organizations I talked to was Airbnb. And the person I talked to there was the head of global diversity and belonging. The theme of Airbnb is belong anywhere. So, so Melissa Thomas Hunt is in this important role as the head of global diversity and belonging to say, well, what the hell does that mean every day? And so when I asked her to, to define culture, she said, culture comes from the way people behave, how they engage, why they give currency to certain things, the markers of their language, what's sanctioned, what's taboo, all of the smallest parts in all of the smallest places. That's what, what adds up to a culture. And ultimately, that's what adds up to a brand. You said one of the biggest mistakes that companies make um, when it comes to the company culture is they treat it as an output or an afterthought rather than the central Tier one priority, it must be, especially in an uncertain world. Elaborate on that for me. Yeah, it's so this is this is pretty interesting. There are lots of surveys about culture that are regularly done. One of the surveys that was done just a couple of years ago, actually just pre-COVID, was done by Deloitte. And they surveyed thousands of uh, C-suite leaders, you know, CEO, CMO, and, and so on. Uh, middle managers and employees. And when they asked all three groups, is culture important? Every one of them off the charts said yes. I mean, we're talking between 88 and 95% of those people in, in each of those groups said, oh my God, culture is critical. And then they asked these really defining questions within to say, and so are you giving it that attention? And what they found overwhelmingly was this massive disconnect between action and statement around culture. That, and, and they even looked at organizations that did training in, in onboarding new employees. They did training along the way that where they would talk about culture. And then they went back and interviewed the trainers and the leaders of those organizations. The majority of them couldn't even say what their culture was. Here they're telling people in a training and yet they don't know themselves. An even smaller percentage said, oh yeah, I think about that in my daily decisions and daily actions. And the tiniest percent said, I actually connect it to that. I think about the connections every day. I'm looking for those connections. So we all know that culture is important, but we kind of think it's going to come out the meat grinder at the end. It'll just be there. If we say our culture is X, that's enough. And instead, culture should be on the front end. Culture is really the chief competitive asset and can be the chief competitive advantage for any team in an uncertain world. Why? Because everything else that you need, a plan, job descriptions, how we incentivize people, great products and service and things like that, in this kind of world, those can go away in a heartbeat. So what do you have left? What you have left, hopefully, is a culture that figures out what you're going to do next, figures out how it's going to adapt. But if you're not investing in that and you're not treating it like your primary asset and your primary advantage, it isn't just going to happen. 
there is a, you know, and that, and that's called intentional leadership, right? Yep. Intentional. So versus accidental when, when we're accidental, we just kind of hope it happens, right? We're just like, you know, let's just do our thing and hope that our culture, like people like it, you know, Uh, we know it's important and and I'll, 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 I'll even take a little of the pressure off them and say, maybe they just don't know how to shape it. Right. Maybe they just, it's not in their, their day-to-day thought. And mm-hmm. I just got finished reading, um, Simon Sinek's book about infinite game. Um, mm-hmm. super smart. Right. And, and he took that principle from, from years ago, reading about somebody else that talked about that, that idea, but the, the finite game that we live day to day, right. Of even hour to hour in a sense, like what you referenced earlier is almost in a sense of survival, right? It's this, this game of, of, okay, especially in uncertain times, right? You could say in uncertain times, I just need to survive. I just, I don't need to be thinking about three years out. I don't need to be thinking about next year. I need to be thinking about right now. And so that finite mindset of got to win the day or I'm going to lose the day. I either won or won the won or lost the game keeps us from building maybe that mindset of culture. And I'm just spitballing here with you, right? That idea of without thinking infinitely about the day's gonna end, whether we won or lost is irrelevant because the game's gonna keep going. The infinite game is going to keep going. And what are we doing purposefully to drive good intentions and good people to do good things for the long haul, right? Um, so how do you balance that, right? The, this sure. long-term mindset of culture, it doesn't happen in a day, but yet in uncertain times, we can become just, we're just surviving. Like, how do you balance that in your world? Yeah, I, so I'm going to give you a quick three-part answer, okay. okay? The first part is that it's a very natural reaction to think that when things become more uncertain, we should batten down the hatches. We should tighten up, right? So that, that points to the first part of what you're saying. Why, why wouldn't I focus on, I'll call them the, the day-to-day fires right now. That's the priority. I've got to survive to get through. But the data is overwhelming and off the charts that says that actually doesn't work. And doing the opposite of actually opening up, being a little more aggressive in the innovative way, um, um, involving more people in how you solve problems, loosening up the power so that they can actually do something about that, their productivity, the productivity of those organizations goes up enormously, and so does their profitability. So if you just look at the data, it should at least be a quick check to say "Mm, that natural instinct of, no, I'm not going to open up to start thinking about culture and things like this. I'm going to buckle down. It's it's a bad instinct, even though it feels like a natural one. Um, The second thing is, is to realize that what we're talking about here are not quick fixes. We're talking about changing habits. And, you know, I hate to say it, everybody would love to have a quick fix. And it's not that you shouldn't pay attention to those things that are pressing on you today. It's that as you do, you should also be proactively changing your habits, including how do we think about culture? How do we involve more people in in defining it? How do we connect that more to what we do? So that's, you know, the first thing is the data would tell you you're wrong in your gut reaction. The second thing is you've got to think of this not as a quick fix, but as a change in habits and that you should do it collectively. And then the third answer I'll give you is this. There are three keys to why organizations that are adaptable, that are rebel leadership organizations actually do this effectively. And I'm not going to, I'm going to list them. I'm not going to talk about each one, but one of them is co-creation. It isn't just one leader at the top with all the answers. It's a co-creation to figure out how to adapt and innovate. Two is diversity that there's a range of people that are engaged in whatever the problem or the opportunity is, which means ultimately you've got to have that range and diversity in your organization. This is also experiential diversity. It's intellectual diversity. It's idea diversity. It's not what we often think of as the top layers of diversity. It can overlap with that, but I'm really talking about something different. And the third thing behind co-creation and, and diversity is inquiry, thinking in terms of questions. 
There's a woman I interviewed for my second book. Her name is Deb Meyer, and she's an education reformer, develops brand new school models, helps troubled schools, things like that. She uses this technique she calls the five habits of the mind. And this gets right to the heart of your question. Well, what, what can people do, right? How can they get going? How can they feel like they don't have to just put out day-to-day -day fires? She says, ask these five questions in everything you do. These are the five habits. The first one is, how do we know what we know? It's like a daily check-in with your assumptions. Sometimes when you check in, they're perfectly fine. But if they're getting irrelevant, if new things are coming in, how do we know what we know is a perfect way to open up to that. The second question or habit of the mind is, is there a pattern? Because sometimes when things change, it's an anomaly. We don't care about those. We don't have time to chase those. But when we see enough anomalies forming a line or going in a certain direction, we better pay attention. So after we've said, how do we know what we know? Is there a pattern? She says, there always comes some question, some version of what if? What if we took what we're seeing and we fixed the problem this way? What if we took what we're seeing and got, went a different direction? The fourth habit of the mind is, is there another way of thinking about it? And it's a way of saying, repeat the first three. There's always another way of thinking about it. Form this into a habit. And the fifth and final question, this comes back to brand. The final habit of the mind is who cares? Because if you're just fighting fires for your own sake, if it doesn't impact your employees or your customers or your partners, maybe that's really not the fire you should be fighting. If we're focused on who cares, all of a sudden we're talking about what matters in the long run? What is going to have the most lasting impact and the most valuable impact? So really just adopting those habits, playing with them as an individual, playing with them in small project teams across a company, it starts to shift how you think about everything, including culture. It doesn't take you away from fighting day-to-day -day fires, but it helps you make that long-term powerful shift. And that's really what this is about. So how would you say that ro that, that wraps into... I guess the new way we need to think about leadership and why is that so important right now, as opposed to by saying we need to think about that, that's the new way to think about leadership. There's an old way to think about leadership. Yes. So think about how, how does that play into those two ideas? There's no hero coming to save the day. That's our old view of leadership. We, even when it's subconscious, we default to believing that whoever is in that corner office or the top of the organization chart or has had the most ideas up to date or has the most power, that they're going to come up with the answers. And in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, it's just not true. On certain days, they will. On other days, they won't. Think of this simple image. Ancient human tribes often had a chief. But on any particular day, the leader might be the medicine woman or the warriors or the gatherers or the people who moved camp from one season to another, one place to another. The idea in those ancient societies, the reason they were able to survive, the reason they were able to evolve and thrive was they allowed leadership to move across the tribe. Wherever it was found that it was the best solution for that moment in time, that's where they went. And that's really what we're cultivating when we talk about rebel leadership. This, this quote or, and that you have behind you, the language, of, the language of man learning to speak creativity. Yes. I'm, I'm curious about that. I, I, this is totally off the wall, but right. Sure. Like, I want to see how that literally plays. off the wall. Yeah. Literally <laughs> off the wall. I, I, I want to hear how that plays into what you're talking about. So that's, that's the cover of my second book. And my, my first book, which is in the middle, a deliberate pause was focused on entrepreneurship. The second book language of man on creativity and this third book on leadership. I'm a big believer in two things. Those three things need one another. To be the best entrepreneur or entrepreneurial thinker, you've got to tap into your creative capacity and you have to evolve beyond that to be a leader and not just the person who, who kicked off the idea or started it. So these three things come together. The second thing that I'm a big believer in is that these are not what we tend to think of them as being. So if, for example, in creativity, if you think of a pie chart, right? And a pie chart with a tiny little slice in the middle, the tiny little slices those people, that small percentage of people that know they're creative and practice using that capacity. And the rest of the pie is every one of us who've been wrongly told we're not. 
So it's an example to say these things, this ability to think entrepreneurially, this creative capacity, this leadership capacity, these are human capacities, right? They are not uh, the images or the output or the product that we often associate with it. A fine work of art, a beautiful painting, a symphony or whatever, that's not creativity. That's a product of creativity. So the way these fit together is that really to, to survive and thrive in any environment, we need all of these, right? Entrepreneurship, creativity, leadership, and we need to allow everybody to tap it if we really want to maximize human potential. Well said. Well said. I love how you brought all those together. As, as a brand guy, consistency alignment is key and it looks like you've been very intentional about thinking uh, you know just about that progress and the process of which you've you've laid out your thinking in your book so Thanks, very, very smart um where can people get a hold of you um where can they get a hold of the book sure so the the book is available on amazon uh the full title is rebel leadership how to thrive in uncertain times but the easiest place to find me is my main website. It's my initials, LR, and the word speaks, lrspeaks.com. There you can find out more about the books. Uh, if you're not a book reader, which I encourage you to become, you can read my articles. I write for a series of publications on these topics, and you can learn more about me in general. Very cool. Larry, you're a rock star. Thank you so much for the enlightening me and having this great conversation and bringing the word brand into this. I love it. Thank you. I did not pay you to say that. Um, so very well done. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for creating the space and giving me the opportunity, Scott. I loved it. So what is a rebellious leader? It is somebody who thinks about new and creative and better ways to solve problems, right? And uncertain times, which are going to happen forever, we are going to have to think about new and better ways to solve problems. And that is the mentality that we need to have, the new mentality we need to have. Also, this idea of it's not just going to be the hero, right? The, the one person that sits in that corner office on the top level is not going to be there to save us all the time. We've got to have collaboration. We've got to have a voice at the table that is different from ours as leaders, we need to have voices at the table that can bring different things to make sure that we're getting the best solution at the right time to deliver on something that's going to help us all achieve what we're trying to do. And that's what bridges into culture. And we talked a lot about that in this interview. So the, the idea of culture and how does that shape what we're doing right now. And that, that was kind of his, his, what he talked about, what culture was, right? It's what we're doing right now. And are we accidental in that? Or are we intentional in that? Um, the biggest mistake he mentions is, is being accidental on how we build our culture. And I also want to bring out that, um, that it, the, the point that he made about, about actually taking action and actually driving action to not just have a statement, that's made, but how can we build something that's more than just a statement? So as we, as we go about that, and I, I feel like I've made a new friend here, Larry, thank you for being on the call. This has been awesome. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading, uh, your book and, and its fullness here. This is going to be really, really cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. If you want to find out more about me, you can go to scottwaldron.com. You can go to YouTube and like, subscribe, comment, share, all that stuff. I would love, I've got some free tools on there that you can get um, access to. And you go to my website, find out more and link up with me on LinkedIn because I love to connect there as well. So thanks for being here today and I hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time on another episode of Unlock.